Hey everybody, Peptide Buddy here. Today we're going to talk about the peptides that are marketed to increase testosterone. Now I think there's a lot of misinformation out there and you all deserve to know about it. And today's cover art is featuring two of my favorite juicy athletes, Sam Sulek and The Arnold. Now, if you haven't already, please just go to the channel, give us a like and a subscribe. A year ago, I couldn't imagine being in a place where we were nearing 1,000 subscribers. And now that it's within reach, I'm going full throttle towards it. So I appreciate it. Thanks in advance. Now, we won't go into all the details here, but a quick review is that testosterone is a steroid hormone derived from cholesterol, like all the other steroid hormones. It's involved in a ton of different biochemical and physiologic processes, and it's both anabolic and androgenic. So we think of it through its involvement in physical development, like male reproduction, secondary sexual characteristics, things like reproduction, fertility, spermatogenesis, gradually reduces with age, the values change by time of day, and it has a ton of different biochemical and physical influences, which we'll get into in a little bit as well. Now, the popularization of testosterone and testosterone replacement therapy is something that's pretty novel, has grown incredibly in recent years, as popularized by Joe Rogan, More Plates, More Dates, Derek especially giving a ton of great information on testosterone, its role, the risks and benefits of its use. I think it's a net positive that people learn about it, but I think that with kind of these increases in just popular culture, its discussions, I'm sure it's being overutilized, especially by younger people who might be blasting or unaware of the consequences of prolonged testosterone use. And this isn't political commentary or a PSA. I think that once everybody reaches a certain age, you know, mid-20s, early 30s, and if they're having symptoms of hypogonadism, maybe fatigue, depressiveness, lack of energy, lack of motivation, of course it's worthwhile to get your testosterone checked, but I feel like I'd be remiss not to mention how popular it has gotten recently. And I'm not going to be here talking about how crucial getting your vitamin D checked is, as important as it is, the Tonkatalis, the Fedojas of the world, I'll save that for Andrew Huberman, but today we're going to dive into peptides, because, well, that's the whole point of this channel. Now, as far as what would give you the highest measured testosterone on a blood test, it would be injection of testosterone itself. And it's important to state that, you know, this is not testosterone that your body is producing, but rather product that you are injecting itself. And another honorable mention is glycoprotein HCG, which is actually secreted in pregnancy, but it's it, is a mimetic of luteinizing hormone, which would thus produce downstream testosterone as well. Okay, so glad we got that out of the way. Okay, so when we talk about drawing vast conclusions from very little information and stating facts without really knowing all the details and spreading false information, GNRH agonists are one of the things that come to mind. Of course, I'd like to be proven wrong, but if you look up gonadarellin and testosterone, you will see wellness companies promoting its use for increasing test, which is sadly mostly wrong. Okay, so the hypothalamus secretes GnRH, leading the anterior pituitary to release LH and FSH, which stimulate production of testosterone and estradiol, progesterone, but the thing is, there's this whole negative feedback system in place which really takes priority here. And so you'll see with that GnRH agonists, when they're used, sure they create a spurt of increased LH, FSH, and resulting testosterone. However, this is just a spurt. This is quick action. With prolonged use, it has been repeatedly shown that there are decreases and eventual suppression of testosterone. And the same goes for triptorelin, which you'll see on the next slide. Yes, there is limited data on use of gonadarellin and triptorelin to increase testosterone and for use in hypogonadism, though you'll see some articles mention that, oh, maybe it could be used because it does cause this quick increased However, there is going to likely, very likely be this sharp decline as a result of continued 
agonism of this GnRH receptor and kind of the downstream product causing downregulation of the anterior pituitaries receptors of FSH and LH causing decreased testosterone in the long run. Now, with regards to KISS peptins, they're kind of interesting. So the KISS-1 gene encodes what's thought to be these tumor suppressor proteins called KISS peptins, which are also found to play a role in GnRH stimulation, which we'll focus on here. So KISS peptin 10, 10 amino acids, is the shortest peptide cleaved from this functional protein. And there's not a lot of research on it. It's all over the place with regards to testing on humans, rodents, and other sorts of animals. However, it shows this same initial pulsatile use with increased LH, FSH, and testosterone, similar to what we just discussed with tryptorelin and gonadorelin, likely due to the same agonism of GnRH. However, there's this same concern with chronic use, and one study actually showed that when rats were given a good amount of kispeptin-54, which, you know, is the bigger molecule, I can't imagine it's that much different in its agonism of GnRH, but it's actually shown testicular degeneration over a pretty quick amount of time in these rats. And as what usually happens on this channel, Samoralin gets a special shout out. It was FDA approved at some point, not anymore. However, for this reason, is not on that suspicious FDA banned list. But quick recap, it's a GHRH analog, agonizes the receptor of growth hormone releasing hormone, causing downstream release of growth hormone and IGF-1, and all of those actions that IGF-1 is purported to do in receptors it's purported to act on. So in conjunction with GHRPs 2 and 6, it's shown that it can lead to increased FSH, LH, and testosterone. Few studies, yes, but it's kind of shined a light on this possible interplay between the growth hormone pathway and the FSH, LH, and testosterone, gonadotropic pathway, which is pretty fascinating to me. And of course, it can't be stated with certainty that somorolin can increase testosterone, but it's shown that it very well may and deserves a special shout out. Now, this may not come as a surprise to many of you, but these experimental peptides that work on Different pathways, some of which are known pretty well, some of which are not well researched at all, are not that good at increasing testosterone. So this is where I would turn to the Hubermans of the world that discuss things like Fedosia, Tonkat Ali, vitamin D optimization, which, you know, is definitely important regardless of your testosterone goals, but just for mood as well. But let's give a special shout out once again to things like sleep, exercise and resistance training, optimized lean body mass, and a well-rounded diet, including adequate fats and proteins. And these have been the things that have time and time again shown to improve testosterone. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I apologize if these outcomes were disappointing, but I hope they do shine a light on those searching for these peptides. As you'll see that there is quite a bit of false advertising that exists out there with regards to these peptides that are supposedly good at increasing testosterone. And if there's one way to keep the FDA confident that they're making the right choice by banning most peptides, it's by giving out false information, unfortunately. That said, I've done a video on the topic. I'm a vast supporter of continued peptide research, as many of you know. That said, Thanks for listening to my rants. Thanks for watching. Please give us a like and subscribe and you all take care.